Hello, I'm Janice Karen, Director of Policy, Technology, and Innovation at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, or MHTC. I run our Data Governance Collaborative, also known as the DGC. We start each of our weekly meetings with a series of industry quick updates to learn about new and proposed regulations, laws, standards, industry initiatives, and other activity. Join us for this week's updates. And if you'll go to the first update, So this isn't new, but it, um, it it was mentioned in one of the articles I recently read on bias and AI, and I thought it was interesting. <laughs> Excuse me. Harvard has a series, they call it an implicit the, the test, but it's a series of online tests to look at your level of implicit bias for certain factors. So each test is looking at a particular area um, and they really cover a wide variety of areas. Some of these are a single test. Some of them have sort of sub areas that they go into. For instance, there's kind of a general religion uh, test. And then there's one specifically that they call Jewish, but it's really Jewish versus Christian. And then one that they call Arab and Muslim, which is kind of a combination of the race and religion um, there. So they look at gen gender, they look specifically at gender and careers and gender and science, uh, sexuality, disability. They have a general race and then they have a bunch of specific ones that they look at, skin tone, weight, age, weapons. They don't say weapons and race, but if you look at it, it's really about, about weapons and race. And the way a lot of them work is um, some of them will ask you some questions first. I didn't look at all of them. But some of them will ask you some questions, but almost all of them either entirely or, or have a component of matching images or picking preferences among different images. And so they're basically uh, looking to see what you favor or how you react to certain questions, things like that. And they, they give you, before you go into the test, before you can even see the list of tests, you have to check off that you understand that that they will provide some commentary on your results based on the research, but the research is general. It may not apply to your specific case. Um, basically, that it's a rough tool meant to give you some information you may not have, but isn't claiming to always be completely accurate. Um, my guess is that that there are people who don't like the results, and so that is kind of a a message to assuage that a little bit. It is not clear uh, if you are, what is actually done with your data beyond, beyond this. So I also wanna give you that warning. I don't know if you're, part, if, if by taking the tests, uh, <clears throat> they're using, I assume since it's by Harvard and based, you know, a research-based project that they are doing using some of your results for additional research work. Uh, I went looking a little bit for specific information about that and didn't find it, but I'm sure I was missing some. I, I, my belief is I missed something obvious because I can't believe they're not doing that. In any case, it was kind of interesting. the The way that they're constructing the test to me is also. Um, potentially interesting and you know they're almost biasing towards certain biases in my opinion so i thought it was kind of interesting but anyway if any and anyone's interesting as long as you check off that disclaimer um you can take any or all of the tests that you'd like and any questions or thoughts All right, then let's move on to the next slide. So the White House has put out a new RFI and the goal here, they call it using AI to monitor employees. It really is all sort of data surveillance related stuff. Um, but they kind of, what they kind of say in the RFI is that there are this data surveillance things that we're, we want you to comment on, but the use of AI to evaluate the data that's collected then makes this an extra level of creepy 
And so that's why they're kind of framing it that way. But I wanted to include it because a lot of the cases that they supply are healthcare related. They specifically talk about monitoring of home healthcare workers, um, locations through the apps that they use to visit with patients. Uh, and I got the impression that that was beyond monitoring for work for specific directly work appropriate things. Um, nurses having the exact time they spend on each task and their location tracked via RFID identification badges all the time. As an aside, I have actually gone to hospitals that require patients to do this. And I, I, I personally find it a little, again, a little bit creepy. Uh, but if you have an appointment, the first thing that you do when you arrive is they hand you an RFID badge and they tell you they're going to track you the entire time that you're in the hospital. So that, uh, but apparently they're doing that uh, to say, you know, track, potentially track, well, you're, you're spending eight minutes per this, per, per instance of this task. The average is six, you need to speed up, things like that. And just sort of, you know, I don't know what all they're tracking, but a lot of things getting tracked there. Um, call center workers being monitored by software that's supposed to judge the emotional state of their customers is another one that came up. And then things like tracking whether um, having computer cameras on machines track whether eyes are engaged on the screen. Also things like keystroke monitors. Um, they mentioned computers taking regular screenshots of what their users are doing and storing them in, in the cloud to be looked at later. Um, you know, and so they just went into a, some, all of these, some of these were listed as specifically in one industry or another, but most of them, other than the ones that were specifically healthcare, um, seemed like they could be happening in any industry. So again, the idea is that the monitoring itself is controversial, but it's getting exacerbated by the AI. So they're asking for comment about this whole process and what should and shouldn't be allowed and how that data shouldn't should shouldn't shouldn't be used, et cetera. So you can find the RFI there. I have not um, looked at every bit of the RFI yet, um, but we will definitely be doing that and looking at uh, whether it's something that we want to comment on or not. Any questions or comments or thoughts there? Yeah, it seems to me that a lot of things that have been around for a number of years are now getting discussed under the rubric of AI, where they wouldn't have been uh, just a few years ago. Um, yeah. For example, for example, location tracking has been around forever. Um, uh, RFID has been around for a long time. Um, uh, sentiment analysis of call center calls. Yeah, there's some natural language processing in there, which is kind of AI related, but um, uh, that's more, you know, algorithm based. You don't need a, a learning system necessarily to to participate in. So, so I, I think it's this it's this large umbrella that's now being called AI that used to be called a bunch of different, more specific, kind of less grand things. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that, but I also think that I don't know that they're necessarily saying that every single, they're necessarily classifying every one of these things as AI, but I think the idea is that these things, some of which, as you mentioned, have been happening for a long time and which have been controversial for a long time, but perhaps not not given as much attention as some people would like, they're, they're getting exacerbated by applying AI analysis to them. So it's not just that the tracking is happening, but it's the it's getting analyzed in more specific and perhaps detrimental ways by applying AI to the data that's available through these mechanisms. That's kind of my take. But I think you're right to some extent as well. I think it's kind of both, I think both are correct. <laughs> Yes, I think those statements can coexist, right? Yep. Anyone else want to comment or have any thoughts on this?
All right, then let's move on to the next one. So the Office of Minority Health put out a statement about their support for language access, and they started with a little bit of data. 22% of people in the US speak some language other than English at home, and 8% in total, I believe that's 8% in total, not 8% of the 22%, um, have limited English proficiency. Uh, and then conversely, only 14% of people in the US are considered to be proficient in health literacy. And they didn't give a specific number of this, but people with limited English proficiency, that's the 8%, are much more likely to lack proficiency in health literacy than other than, than the general population. So the general population is really bad at it. And people who have limited English proficiency are much worse than the general population. So what OMH is doing is they sort of have three, three things they're trying to do to attack this. They are promoting some national standards for what they're calling culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And they have a fifth, fifth set of 15 action steps in what they're calling the national class standards. And the CLAS is culturally and linguistically appropriate appropriate services. That's what that acronym is. And so um, they're trying to get some standardization in terms of what should be supported uh, for people who don't speak English and different um, types of programs that should exist. And they're also supporting some of those language access programs and additional policy development in this area through a variety of areas, including grants. And then they're also looking at improving the federal government's programs specifically, particularly within HHS. Um, they've, there's a language access steering committee that's been set up and they are looking to implement goals that were specified in the HHS equity action plan around language um, accessibility. So you can find more information in this uh, OMH blog post. And I thought it was kind of interesting and something to keep an eye on on the equity front. Any questions or thoughts there? All right, then let's move on. All right, so the last, I believe this is the last one. I don't think I stuck anything in at the last second. CMS has updated its definition of digital quality measure. And it's, that's the way that they're phrasing it. It's a little bit of a misnomer because they haven't necessarily changed their definition. They've added additional material around the definition to sort of enhance it, the definition. But what they're saying, that what the phrasing that the language that they're using is that there are now four parts of the definition of digital quality measure. And the first part is a description of the CMS goals for digital quality measurement and how DQMs contribute to what they're, they've started calling a learning health system. I heard that um, term a lot yesterday at an event I went to. It appears to be the new language being used for um, basically making adjustments based on data that you have. It's not a bad term. It just seems to just have kind of popped up out of nowhere. As the as the thing to use, so so be aware that that's that's a term that's now cropping up a lot. So the the next piece is the actual definition of the digital measures, and also how they how they interact with and hinge on different standards and different technology related to interoperability. Then the definition also includes examples of digital data sources. And then sort of some descriptions of the CMS efforts to move to fire, particularly around the adoption of electronic clinical quality measures. So this next part actually does not come from the CMS definition update. Um, I went over, one of the things that always comes up whenever we have this conversation is what is the difference between a DQM and an ECQM? So um, N2QA has, a nice write-up about this. So this this section comes from the 
NCQA page, which is linked at the bottom. Uh, so D basically DQMs are more general. They're, they use, they're quality measures that use data from an array of electronic sources. They do get data from EHRs, but they also use claims data, registries, patient surveys, all basically any source of electronic health related data is fair game for DQM and across whatever is appropriate for the purpose or measurement goals of the measure. ECQMs are a subset of DQMs and they specifically pull data from EHRs and they are looking to measure specific clinical goals. And NCQA has this sort of uh, little mnemonic where D stands for diverse data sources and E stands for EHRs. So the DQMs are uh, basically the more general subset of any type of electronic quality measure. And the ECQMs are clinical measures that come from EHRs. Any questions about any of that? All right, so I, you can uh, find the general CMS page um, in the first link and then that little write up from NCQA on the second page. And, <laughs> and uh, if there's no question, if there are no questions, then let's uh, move on. All right, so if you'll pause there. I hope you learned a lot from our quick updates. If you're interested in finding out more about the DGC and its other activities, email me at dgc at myhealthdata.org. That email address is also on your screen.